Tons of activity on the racetrack. That means it's time for us to get down to the third member of our broadcast team, Antelopa. I'm down here on the grid with Bobby Fong. Bobby got caught up in a pretty bad crash yesterday. Tell us about what happened. You know, I was just trying to avoid an accident, and uh, by doing that, I got in an accident. So uh, I bruised myself up pretty good, but, um, you know, we went out in practice this morning. We are pretty sore. Um, I didn't do too many laps just due to strength, but uh, I'm going to give it all I got in the race and uh, try to finish this race for myself and my team. We're glad you're okay. Thanks, Bobby. Best of luck. I talked to him a little bit this morning, Greg, and he felt like he had a couple maybe ribs uh, broken or or whatever, so it's good to see him actually lined up. He had a pretty good warm-up this morning, went really fast, so it's good to see Bobby lined up. An incident that was created by Garrett Gerloff, who won't be starting this race, but that, of course, other than those nagging pains from some of the riders involved in that, is ancient history as Cameron Bobier on pole position for this one with Tony Elias in second spot and Matthew Skultz in third talk, on the grid. Talk about that. Like this morning, yeah. they, they have found some stuff. And uh, with Matthew, and this morning he was absolutely flying in warm up. They found a couple things. I know you know. Yeah, about and, that. and and he was so excited. Jason, we'll talk about that in a second because you've got to take us around this fantastic natural road course built in 1950. Another another rider favorite for sure. Uh, very natural road course. Big long front straightaway down into turn one. A lot of heavy braking there. Turn two and turn three are a little bit technical. You're leaned over. Some of the guys doing a downshift into there. Into four, five, six is where. You get the best drive you can down into turn seven. You go all up along that ridge, Greg, and then down the, the last couple turns of this of this track are all steep downhill onto this big, long front straightaway. It's a great track. Cameron Bobier was our pole sitter, 23-7. Tony Elias second, Matthew Skultz then, row two. Roger Hayden, good to see him out there. Bobby Fong, Josh Heron, who I expect some more from today. I bet you that Josh got with Richard last night, made some changes to that motorcycle. Um, uh, Cameron Peterson, another guy yesterday who did a tremendous job running up there close. Only 1.1 off in pole, uh, off a of pole in qualifying. Jake Lewis, David Anthony, and then Kyle Wyman, Danny Eslick, Sebastian Ferreira round out row four. Row five, and our final row, Bruno Silva, Max Flinders, and San Bergerico. All right, so you talked about Roger Hayden being out there, and this is the corner where he was involved in that incident yesterday. Roger Hayden just going uh, rear end over front end on the motorcycle. I talked to the crew, Jason, and they basically had to replace about 60% of his motorcycle. So, you know, it was, it was big parts, too. And um, Brad, the Olean's guy, went through the forks to definitely check that out and make sure that everything was good, but also... He hit his head, did Roger Hayden, and he had to go through the Moto America concussion protocol and uh, was able to get through that and obviously race. So as the motorcycles make their way around this Virginia International Raceway, VIR race course on their warm-up lap, let's get down to Hannah, who has our last minute cycle gear report. You may notice that Garrett Gerloff is absent from the grid this afternoon after a pretty bad crash if you were with us yesterday. Um, I heard that he's still at the hospital. They're just running some extra tests on him. He may have a bruised lung, so we wish him well. But other than that, for the most part, he's in one piece, so we're really happy that Garrett's okay. We hope he heals up quick, and we're looking forward to seeing him at the next race. Okay, thanks so much for that, Hannah. And that was, if you joined us yesterday, you noticed that the gap in the grid uh, is no longer there. Roger Hayden next to Bobby Fong, and that moved Josh Heron up to row number two. And that gives him just a, a little bit of an advantage as well from his qualifying position from Saturday. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I saw Tony just there waving to something coming down the front straight. He's going to be pulling past us here in a second. But, um, yeah, not exactly sure. I'm just looking out my window because I saw Tony waving. Almost like, you know, sometimes when you're doing that, you might have seen something from another rider's bike on the warm-up lap. And, uh, but everybody's taking their grid spots. Everybody's back, and it's a good move for Josh Heron. He gets to bump up a spot, Greg, and, and we know Josh can get good starts there. He's on the, the inside of the second row. So here we go, race number two of the Motul Superbike class. When the lights go off, let's see what kind of start Tony Elias gets. He was crushing it yesterday. Oh, but a good start as well from, start from Raj. Raj. Yeah, Roger second Hayden. row. Great start for Roger Hayden. And, and, uh, but Tony's got out front early, and Matthew again, fourth off the line. And it's all going to be a matter for Matthew of how quick he can get to up to these guys. He's already got by Raj going in and through turn one. So now Matthew's right where he wants to be. He's got, got anybody in front of him but the two guys that were setting the pace yesterday. Matthew Skultz can run the pace of the two guys in front of him. So I expect to see three riders in this one as, as Josh Heron now has moved himself past Roger Hayden as well. 
So, you know, and Roger's got some, some bumps and bruises from yesterday. I know that for a fact. I had a talk with him last night, text messaging with him, actually, and uh, I know he's sore in some places Oof. that are pretty important. <laughs> Josh Heron getting a little sideways there, working that Yamaha R1. Attack performance here in combat. There's a look, Roger Hayden just left part of your screen. Jake Lewis. Great start for Jake, up to six really, really early, and he's got Raj right in front of him, but here you go. Matthew Skult's already taken a look. I've been waiting for a dry race to see what Matthew will do with Cameron and Tony because I feel like he, not only does he have the pace, but he's got the he's got the nerve, Greg. He's got the nerve to be able to, these guys are just two other guys to him on the grid. They're nothing else but. And Josh Heron on this opening lap is going to is gonna bring himself right to the front as well. He's going to try to go underneath Skultz as they come down in through this turn 14 area. First lap is underway. And Josh is trying to do something with Skultz right off the bat. And this is exactly what Matthew doesn't want as he, as he slides it back up underneath Josh in turn one. Let's see if on the flip back over into turn two, if Heron can get back underneath him. He can't. But I said that they may have made some changes to that attack R1 to get Josh a little bit more comfortable. And it looked like that's what they've done. Yeah, there's no love between Matthew Skultz and Josh Heron. I mean, not that they don't like each other. It's just, hey, when they're on the racetrack, it's anyone's position. Yeah. They're not going to give it up at all. And yesterday there was a, an incident between the two riders that saw Josh Heron run off the racetrack. In my conversation with both Matthew Skultz, the number 11, and Heron, number two, as he slides his way into third spot, Heron, both of them said it was just one of those incidents. There wasn't enough room on the racetrack to make the turn for both bikes, and Heron had to take a ride off in turn number 10. Yep, and both guys ride for really, really good teams that are very well put together. So here comes Josh as he's looking down the inside right now of Cameron Bobier as they get into turn 10. But now this field, Raj has closed back up. Jake Lewis has closed up onto the back of this group as well. Early stages of this race looks almost like the Super Sport race. Battle for second spot, Roger Hayden, Yoshimura Suzuki. Injured in yesterday's melee, big crash for him. I mentioned he passed that concussion protocol Moto America has in place. And I went and got all the details of that concussion protocol and it is a very thorough exam, including some uh, goggles that you have to go through and test with no medication. You can't have any pain medication and make sure you have no symptoms. So Roger Hayden and the crew thinking. Mm. Josh wanted to have a look there at Cameron going into turn three. You know, he's good up into turn seven. He's going to try something right now, Greg, as they go into turn four. He gets the thing back then stopped, and he's through on Cameron Bobier. So <laughs> oh. Josh Heron doing exactly kind of what I thought they might do. You know, Richard's really, really good at looking over the data and trying to make some changes. And uh, right now, Heron's going forward. Josh Heron, tack performance. Heron compound Yamaha. That's a privateer machine. Richard that Jason's talking about is Richard Stamboli, the owner of Attack Performance, now going after Tony Elias. So it's Factory Suzuki versus Privateer Yamaha, Factory Yamaha, Privateer Yamaha, and Factory Suzuki. And this is exactly what Moto America has been designing this class with world rules to have this exact parity in this class, not only between manufacturers, but between the teams themselves. Yep, and we see it just in the background there that Jake lost a little time in that first split. He lost six tenths in the first split. So maybe there was a slight mistake made. Talking about Jake Lewis? Jake Lewis, sorry. He was yeah. just up there behind, uh, yeah. behind Raj. And now Raj is kind of right behind these top four. Bobby Fong now has closed up on Jake Lewis. So we'll see if, keep an eye on Jake, see if he can close that gap back up. But things back up at the front. Tony's leading the way. Josh has kind of settled himself into second. The pace though, Greg, 24-8, 24-5 for Heron that lap. 24 fives and fours and threes and twos are what we saw out of Skultz this morning leading the way in warm-up. So right now, full tank of fuel, kind of feeling each other out a little bit here, four laps in. I'm expecting to see all these guys start jumping into the 24s really consistent as they all just did it right now on this lap for the first time. A couple things that the Yamalu Westby Racing Yamaha team did for Matthew Skultz, give him a little bit more of a front-end feel. And when I ran into him earlier today, Matthew Skultz was very, very excited. He was excited about the pace he ran in warm-up, but he was also excited about the feel. Additionally, his crew chief, Ed, told me that they took a little bit of traction control out of that motor. He's going to allow that rear tire to spin a little bit more, but it is going to allow him to have the drive onto the front straightaway he wants. Josh Heron all over the racetrack right now. At the moment, trying to find a way around Tony Elias. Tony is pace. a fighter. Josh has pace, though. I can see it. You know, he's got pace down this hill, all up through the top in turn eight and nine as well. Pace, but does he have the patience? Yeah, well, 
When you got pace and you feel like you want to take advantage of the tire while it's new, you want to get by guys as quickly as you can. So that's what you're seeing from Josh. He's already made quick work of Skultz and Bobier. So right now he's just doing his best to try to close up on the back of Tony to do something with him as quickly as he can, and then we'll see what mm. kind of what kind of times he can run on his own. The, the thing is, is it's very hard to pass Tony. When Tony gets into this groove where he's in right now. Tight lines. Yep, he's very tight into places. So, you know, we saw these two guys come together last year up in turn 10, and Josh is really, really strong out of turn 9 and the lead-up and the build-up to turn 10. And you can see Raj has oh. come into the pits. I'm, I'm thinking he's, I think he's just too sore, to be honest with you, Greg. Yeah, he kind of pointed to uh, to his helmet there, so... Roger Hayden, what an effort that he put in to get out on that motorcycle after a huge, huge crash. If you've seen any of those pictures on social media, you know that that dude was airborne. Oh, Josh Heron, a little deep. A little wide. Yeah, into turn number seven, trying to make it all up on the gas. As you can see, that that attack performance R1 protesting under his throttle hand right now. Cambobier is just kind of hanging back there. So now it's left up to these four at this point. Tony Elias, Yoshimura Suzuki, our reigning national champion. He wears the number one plate. Behind him, number two, Josh Heron. That is the attack performance. Heron compound machine. And then you have Cameron Bobia and the Monster Energy Yamalube factory racing machine. And then Yamalube Westby Racing's Matthew Skultz. Don't ever count him out of this. The only question mark, I think, for this team, the number 11 team, is what's the rear tire going to do beyond this point? Yesterday we saw a lot of grip start being lost after lap number five as Tony Elias gets the thing sideways into turn one. Is he able to hold it back down to the apex? Mm. He is. Josh's bike is spinning up a lot. He's trying a lot on the exits, but see Tony gives it a lot of input while he's still really heavy on that front brake, Greg, and that's why you see the bike backing in because he's getting it in there tighter and down to the apex earlier. He's not going to allow somebody to try to come up underneath him. It's going to be a big move to either go around the outside of him or he's got to try to position himself further back uh, or they, they're going to. And here's Josh. He's strong into seven. See how Tony moves over to the right, though, and, and enters so tight? It makes it really, really hard. So Josh was amazing out of the S's that time on the run down to turn seven, but it's really hard to do something with Tony going in there. But now he's kind of ramping up this pass that, that I'm feeling is going to come. Look how much faster he is up through eight and nine. Now we're going to see if he can do anything, get up alongside of him into ten. Not, not that lap. There's a little curbing there that if you hit it, it can do one of two things. You can jump it and be absolutely smooth, or it can kind of upset the chassis. And just that lap, it just upset the chassis enough for, to, to, for Josh where he decided not to try to make it that pass. Getting ready to go 17 laps to go as Yosh Yoshimura factory rider Tony Elias leads us onto the front straightaway. And across the stripe, a good look at factory Suzuki horsepower versus privateer Yamaha horsepower. And watch Tony get it sideways and just take it right to the inside of that corner. If you're going to pass Tony, you've got to go the long way around. There's Richard Stamboli, right part of your screen, just took his glasses off. There's Daisuke, the crew chief for Tony Elias, who leads the way. A oh, little up and over the curb as well, getting that number one bike a little bit squirrely. So Cam Bobier losing a couple of bike lengths in this section. Josh is fast all through here. Look how quick that bike turns. Look at the drive he gets. But see, Tony will move over to the right here, and it makes it very hard to try to go underneath him. And you can see Josh gets in there deep, probably running wide. Yeah, he's in there deep. He's on the same exact line. They're not going to be able to get by here and there, I don't think, because he was able to square it up. But if he goes in on the, as fast and on the same exact line as, as Tony, the bike doesn't operate the same exact way. Tony has a way of setting up a bike for himself. Uh, that he's able to do that. And it's really hard for other guys to do it, which makes him very hard to pass. Just trying to take a look at the different riding styles of these riders, Jason, and, and who's abusing that tire the worst. I mean, Tony's pretty smooth. He gets into turn one. He sends it sideways. But here's Watch another look at what see, we just saw. There's a moment there for Josh where he realizes, oh, I'm in here deep. That's why you see the rear of the bike come off, off the ground. But he's able to get out there and still get the bike turned. Cameron thought for a minute that he could get underneath him. But Amazing bike gonna, control. Yeah, by all these guys. I mean, and they're all pushing. That's the thing is every one of them are pushing. Matthew's just kind of, it looks like Matthew's just kind of sitting there right now. He realizes that just getting by Cameron isn't going to really matter much because he realizes how hard Heron is going after Tony right now as well. Yeah, and after their battle yesterday, he knows exactly how hard Josh Heron is willing to go to stay in front of the 11 bike. Yep. And, and, you know, Josh did a very good job early getting by these two, but this guy here is so hard to pass. Now watch the run he gets through 
all, all this little area here. Five, six, seven. You know, all through these S's, he's so fast, but he has to position himself on the left-hand side, and this time he's done that a little bit more. You can see he's just on the left a little bit more. He's going to be tighter to the curbing now when he goes up the hill than he was last lap. It just makes it really hard to, to try to, you know, pinpoint a spot. Like, you almost want to feel like you can try to push Tony into making a mistake, but yeah. he doesn't make them. Yeah, that's the problem. He just doesn't make them. Josh Heron is credited with the fastest lap of the race so far. A 124.558. That was done on lap number three. So, like you are saying earlier, Jason, we know that Josh Heron has pace. Yep. The question is, after looking at this now for these last couple laps, JP, w where? Where, yeah. where is Tony it's Elias vulnerable at this point to even pass the guy yep well he pulls the bike down to the he, he really pulls the bike down to the apex so early even in turn nine to ten it looks like he's going to be on the outside of the track and but see what happens right now is watch how early he turns in see how much earlier he turns in than the mm -hmm. three behind him and what a what a job jake lewis is doing right now 25 flat he's still only three seconds behind the leader of the race and just plugging in the laps bobby fong as well in sixth M4X star Suzuki rider Jake Lewis, his father passed away just a couple of days ago, out on social media last night, basically thanking everyone, thanking the Moto America series, the fans, and all the people that are supporting him. He feels like this was the absolute best thing that he could do for himself after his father unexpectedly passed away, was get out on the racetrack and refocus on his job. He knows that his dad wanted him to do that, and Jake Lewis in a solid fifth spot. Bobby Fong, our feature from earlier, out there on that Quicksilver Lexan Moto Hudson Motorcycles at Yamaha R1 as he's transitioning this year from a different brand of motorcycle, getting used to this team, getting used to this motorcycle, and Bobby Fong sits four seconds adrift of that crazy battle we have up front in sixth position. Which is nothing when you think about it. I mean, there yeah. they go. Like Matthew Skultz has just made a move underneath Cameron Bobby. So I really feel like the pace at the front, I, I, feel, I feel Matthew could have push that pace even more had he got a better start and got up front. Now maybe he feels like it's a good time to get past, see if he can go up here and do something with Heron. But again, these guys are going to run into that number one plate that's very hard. You asked me earlier, where do you do it? Where are you going to try to go by him? It's got to be a mistake or it's got to take a big move. And last year, Josh made a big move in turn 10. And this year, I feel like that's going to be his best spot again because he gets to run through eight and nine so well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you think about last year, if, if uh, Tony Elias's pit board is telling him Josh Heron's behind him, Tony's a really smart rider. He learns from what happens on the racetrack, and he'll definitely be thinking about it. The one who looks most threatening right now is Skultz, but Skultz knows that even if he gets a chance to get by Heron, he's going to fight right back. Yeah, that's exactly this right. Is the and move. Yep, and great, replay. Great, great move by Matthew. And see, what we'll do is when they come up back up to that segment here or that section again, you're going to see that where Tony exits nine is pretty normal, but he cuts off the entry to turn ten so early. These guys know what he does. To get up alongside of him before he do before he does that is almost impossible. So this is kind of the run up, and I believe the guys in the Yamaha, as you can see how close they are. But what happens is is that see where Tony is now. But watch when he comes back into screen, see how tight he is compared mm -hmm. to the rest. That last little spot, right before he tips in, he just gets in there earlier than the rest of them. You know what I'm thinking, Jason, if I'm Matthew Skultz, the opportunity for him would be when Josh Heron tries to make a move around Tony Elias and box him, if I am Matthew Skultz, that's when I'm trying to go. Just try to get by two riders at once. Well, it's got to be not, what I, I kind of, I don't disagree, but what I think is going to happen is that when Heron sits up because he realizes he can't get past uh, Tony when he sits up, that's when Matthew's got to strike. Matthew's mm -hmm. got to strike then. Matthew's got to be close enough to where when he gets in the draft of Heron, oh. and they're going, nope, he's trying to go underneath him. Sorry, that was the yep. mistake from Tony. I yep. think he just Little got wide. in there a little wide. We thought he might have it. Sorry, Jay, continue yep. no, with your no, thought. No, 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 but I think that what's going to happen is that when he sees that Heron is content, just kind of slow. Here we go, Greg. Turn three. Nope, not quite close enough. But even into turn seven here in a minute, if Heron makes a move to the left and realizes that he can't go by or underneath Tony, that's going to be the spot where Matthew's got to try to strike on him. The one thing we don't know is can Tony Elias push the pace, meaning if someone goes by him, we've, we've, we, we talked about it yesterday, we've seen this movie mm. before. Heron, he's just, he's been in that, Jay. Not as wide. He did good there to keep, to keep it back down. Yeah. yeah. Had it, it back then. Doesn't seem that his motorcycle works as well, Josh Heron's motorcycle, as well as the other riders around him heading into turn number seven. Yeah, just on a tighter line. You know, he's, here you go. Matthew's going to come up underneath him now, and that's, and that's kind of what I was talking about. <laughs> you know, there's no way that Josh feels that he can get by Matthew. So 
Heron's going to, you know, and Josh's the kind of guy that's going to fight right back. He's not going to sit back really and watch Matthew and try to figure out where Matthew's going to get Tony. You know, I feel like Josh is going to try to fight back pretty quickly. That's what he does. That's what I love about him. So uh, this, this time, though, Matthew gets a good drive out of there. Josh isn't going to be close enough. Oof. So we're going to get we're going to get a lap or two here now and see where Matthew is going to try to try to do something with Tony as well. Max Flinders, Thrash Bike Racing LLC, getting out of the way and letting this battle go. So Flinders does a good job of getting out of the way. All right, so it's now Tony Elias, Matthew Skoltz, Josh Heron, Cam Bobier has been sitting back there. There are certain sections in the racetrack where you can see that Bobier struggles a little bit with grip on his motorcycle, but Skoltz, he was happy, he's, he's he was pace. excited, and no. he's got pace right now, and he's got a lot more confidence in the front end of his Yamaha R1 than he did yesterday. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see now because the pass that he made on Josh in the Oof. last lap is going to be very difficult to do to Tony. So he's, it's going to have to be a very, very early commitment out of nine to try to get up alongside. Now, this is where Matthew can use his size a little bit more, too, over some of the other guys. He can get himself off the inside of the bike, and you can see the bike sliding um, as he came through nine. This lap here, Tony has, has pulled a little bit of a gap up through that top section on them to where they weren't close enough at all. Coming, uh, coming into turn 10. 12 laps remaining, getting ready to work 11 to go as we take a look at Yamalu Westby Racing's Matthew Skultz. There's his crew chief, Chuck, Chuck Giacchetto behind him as they take a look and do it old style. He's going to click the watch and see what kind of lap time his rider did. 27 or 24 7 a piece for Elias and Skultz, 24 8 for Heron, and a 24 8 for Cambobie. So you know, the thing that makes me nervous for these guys right now is that Tony did his fastest second split. That's why those guys weren't getting close enough to him at the top. And you can see Cameron Bobier now has made the move past oh. Josh Heron up to third. So Cameron Bobier has made that pass that he wanted to make. Incredible ride by Josh Heron so far. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can the amount of time they've had on this motorcycle and, of course, attack performance, that's a custom swing arm. Designed and CNC machined by Richard Stamboli at Attack Performance. A lot of custom trick parts on that motorcycle. Working on getting that you know whole motorcycle package together. The fact that they're showing this kind of pace, it wouldn't surprise me though. Josh was working so hard at the beginning of this race, as if he's starting to feel a little bit of slip and slide underneath him on those dumb sure. slicks. You can see Josh's bike getting loose. All of them are getting a little bit loose. Sure. But but you're, for the amount of time that they have had on that bike, you got to remember, they didn't get to do Road Atlanta on that motorcycle. They went to Coda, and uh, here's a really good slow motion shot. There's a look at the tires that Tony Ellis is on, the Dunlop front soft and rear soft both. Mm -hmm. And um, But, yeah, those guys have had such little time on that bike to be doing what it, to, to be running the lap times he's running is great. 24-5, I'm looking this time. Cameron Bobie, it's fastest lap of the race. So... Maybe the two-time champ has just been kind of sitting back there, letting these guys do their thing, watching what's going on. He doesn't look very, he doesn't look very stressed sitting there, though. I can tell you that he looks very comfortable. And but but Matthews ran into that same problem now, hasn't he? Like he just hasn't been able to figure out, you know, how do I get by Tony? Where is Tony vulnerable? That and really is the question. He just isn't. He isn't. And the, well, the only chance you have, Jay, is if you can get a drive on him and get up alongside of him somewhere. But he's so good off the corners. Well, it's not just that, but he closes off the direction that you want to go before you even think about going there. Like, generally, you want to go up the inside of somebody here, but it's pretty impossible. And you might look on the TV screen and say, well, he's only three-quarter track. And now you just look back <laughs> to say, oh, I do have, like, all four people behind me. That's why I keep getting plus zeros on my board. But the thing is, is that... He closes off your idea of, okay, i got to position myself to the inside. Like, see, here's the spot where I think that these guys have to try, but they know, that, see how early he closes it off? He, it makes it very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. And a good drive. So Tony Elias continues to lead us. This is the battle for first place. So one of these riders, if they can make it all the way to the end, is going to miss out on the podium. And see, Heron is just right there. He's running the same pace as these guys. Nobody's going anywhere in this group. But see, you'll see here that you'll see how close they are to him. By the time they get into the corner, and here comes Cameron. He's going to try to slide it up underneath, Ooh. and he does. So maybe Cameron feels like he can do something with it now. Now we got all three Yamaha guys that are, are going to be taking shots. Uh, two of them have tried already and not been successful. Let's see if the third one can. 
Matthew was doing something at full yeah. lean angle in that corner with his left hand, almost like he was trying to take a tear off mid corner. It looked like it, but yeah, I don't, I don't know, know what he was doing there. I don't know if it's frustration or uh, yeah, it could have been a tear off though. Could have been maps possibly, but I mean, usually you can operate that with your thumb, meaning oof, a yep. little bit of movement. I mean, we've seen that tail section kind of bouncing around on Heron, but that one was a bit of a, there goes Josh Heron. He takes a tear off in that section. So Tony Elias, nice tight line again. Up the hill he goes. 25-1 last time by the stripe. Heron still credited with the fastest lap of the race. That was back on lap three. And unless something really happens, Tony Elias is starting to try to pull the pin, Jay. Yep, 39-2 in that first split. So that's the fastest split of the race of the first split. So now Tony has paced this race for as long as he has. And I can't, can't tell how hard it is. You know, this guy's got a ton of experience doing it now, but it's very difficult to lead a race like this when you see plus zero on your board every single lap. And when now he knows too, Greg, that he's got not just one person he's dealing with, but he's got three behind him. So he wants to be very careful that if he lets one person through, that he doesn't let all three of them go through. So that lap, that lap there, 24-6, his personal fastest split. But see how much of a gap he's got like right now? Do you see that? Mm -hmm. That's all because of how he enters the corner. Um, he's got some speed, obviously, down the straightaway, but the way he breaks and then releases the lever uh, at, at the apex, he just trails off there a lot further into the corner, which allows him to break a little bit deeper in. Tony Elias working it hard. His personal best split last time around in the last section. So a 24-6. Cam Bobier trying to go with him at this point as Matthew Skoltz has been relegated back to third spot. The question is, does Josh Heron have a shot at the podium? He's starting to drift just off the back of these three front runners. Well, they've, they've all dropped the pace a little bit in, in the certain sectors. And so right now, Matthew's doing his best to try to stay on the back of Cameron. That, that first split there for Matthew was his fastest of the race. And, uh, you know, these, these are our three title contenders right now as far as the points go as well. About seven and a half laps remain in this Motul Superbike class race. Tony Elias leading the way on that Yoshimura factory Suzuki. He has shown everyone the way around VIR for the moment. Cameron Bobier on the Monster Energy Yamalube factory racing Yamaha. And then that privateer machine, Yamalube Westby Racing's Matthew Skultz. And this looks like it's the battle for the podium. Yeah, and that's the lap there. 24-7s 20, for the first three guys and 25-2 for Josh. So... That was the lap there that Josh just started to fall off the back with seven to go now. And there's Jake Lewis still holding down a, an incredible fifth place right now uh, for Jake. And I have to say for Jake Lewis on the M4X-Star Suzuki, the only other rider of those top four in the 24s, a 24-8 as his best. Here's 60 helmets, Kyle Wyman. Kyle still battling back pain. He said he was about 80% of what he normally is. And he's caught in a fight. It looks Danny like Eslick. Danny Eslick yep. on that... Shiby Racing Hayes Brakes Machine. So Danny Eslick on that BMW, that seven spot as we've seen Bobby Fong drift back into eighth. So Kyle Wyman is about 5.7 seconds back from Jake Lewis, but he's trying to fight off the advances of a very talented Danny Eslick. Yeah, and they're, they're continuing to make that BMW a little bit more comfortable for Danny to ride on. And even uh, just looking at it on our screen right now, the bike looks a lot better than it had earlier in the weekend when I was out there kind of watching it. And uh, this bike's going to – I'm looking forward to seeing Danny on this bike at Road America. I think that the BMW's got some legs for sure. And uh, I think that they're just going to continue to make that bike better. Now you got to – here's our front three, Greg. Cameron has really closed up, and he's got a run on Tony. But let's see, is he going to try to go down to the inside of him? He is. And oh, Tony, how you doing? Cameron Bobier trying to make it work for him in what's been a Tony Elias spot the whole time. He just couldn't get it slowed down. Now, we saw that move yesterday. We saw Tony mm -hmm. doing that to Cameron all day yesterday. Like for four laps in a row, we saw Cameron uh, or Tony go down the inside. Now they've got one little bit of traffic. Looks like they're going to come up on here. And they should be able to get, ooh, there's two guys actually. Yep. Hopefully they're going to be able to get by both of these guys down this next little short shoot, which I think that they should be able to do. The crew looking on. Oh, is that? Uh, good guys right yep. there getting out of the Bruno way. Bruno Silva and uh, Sam Bertorico. Yep, good guys. So good move by those two. They know the blue flag procedure that it's coming. This is the race, and they got a, a short look at an absolutely spectacular battle as now the fastest lap of the race has just been recorded. 17 laps 
into this race, Jason. That's how great and amazing these Dunlop tires are holding up under this brutal pace. A 124.518 for Matthew Skultz. Yep, and you know, again, this is where I, I, I would love to have seen Matthew get a start right off the line and get into that turn one first because I think he had a lot of pace uh, uh, a lot of, uh, this morning. He yeah. was just clicking them off like nothing. I know it was a little cooler this morning, but uh, here we go. These top three guys, Cameron's going to take another shot at it. He's got to get up close enough to just get up alongside Tony. But now Tony's going to be wary of it, you know, from that last time that Cameron gave it a go. Tony a little wide. Cam trying to sneak it up the inside, nearly side by side. Nothing between them right now. This is a very interesting line that Tony takes. He just holds it tight and just rushes it on in there. Yeah. Putting a lot of, just asking so much from the edge grip of that Dunlop slick. Tony Elias, he's your number one rider. He's number one on the screen, Ooh. number one place. It's getting close now between these three guys. Like really, like everything's just getting tightened up. Five laps to go in this one. About four and a half. Cameron looks a little tidier in that section at the moment. Uh, I think one of the lasting impressions I had of yesterday was seeing how bum Cameron was after he came across the line, just kind of really dejected look when he got the checkered flag. And, and the thing I love about Cam is he's going to take a shot. There's no question. You can guarantee that Tony will take a shot when he's in second, and it's the same thing for Cameron Bobier. He's not going to oh, sit man. there. He's going to try to make something work. But what he's got to try to do, Greg, is the same thing that Tony did to him yesterday. When they come onto this front straightaway right now, he doesn't need to make the pass before the turn. If he, There's a way that he can just get up alongside Tony and just – pace himself into the turn with him and hold it to where Tony can't turn the bike in. That's what he's got to try to do. Here you go. He's trying it again. Not quite close enough. Jason, I had a chance to go to the Ocean Mercury last night and take a look at Tony's data. Oh, he was in there deep. He gets a turn, though. To look at Tony's data, they were... Yep. Oh! There's almost a bit of a collision between those two riders. But, again, the different like line. You, but like you noted before, that line. Here comes Cameron. He's going to try to square it up. Oh! Wow. Ooh, Ooh. Come on, Cam. Can Close. you get it slowed down? But see, that's what... The, but Cam, I love him. Because he's going to try all kinds of things to try to work his way past Tony. And all those little things, Tony's going to remember. You know, Tony mm -hmm. runs it really tight to turn three. And Cameron's going to run it out, try to carry a lot of corner speed, get the bike picked up off the edge of the tire, and run it up underneath him into four. So back to what I was saying when I was able to look at some of the data that they have on this Yoshimura Suzuki. When they come across start finish line, there's always a moment where Tony rolls off the throttle. There's a big bump actually there. And when he went to the checkered flag because Cameron was pushing him so hard yesterday, the throttle was almost completely open. <laughs> yeah. Just in that one lap of all the laps we raced, and his crew, I was there when his crew showed it to him, and he just went, oh, man, <laughs> you don't want to do that every lap. Checkered flag was motivating, I guess, yeah. Uh, yeah, so. checkered flag was motivating. So, but, but Cameron's, now see, Cameron's closer this lap. This is, the, this is close. So if he can get in Tony's draft, as soon as they come through this little kink, what he's got to try to do is he's got to just try to position himself just under. And you can see, I can see he's trying to do that. You can see him on the right, but, but he's got he's to just be a little bit closer still. Now he's going to try to square this up because he realizes Tony's ran wide a couple times. But see, Tony's so, so cagey. He knows when he's opened up something in, in laps previous, and he tries to correct it. Now, again, too big of a gap here for Cameron to make up going into the next corner. Tony has that particular corner from apex to apex figured out. But can you see the corner speed that Cameron carries through turn three and how much he draws up on the back of him mm -hmm. from the apex to the exit? That he wants to be able to take advantage of, but he can't because uh, Tony shuts the door so quickly into four. Like right here, he's on the right-hand side of the track. It makes it impossible for you to go down underneath somebody or you've got to be so close to them to do it. It's a big, big move. A little bit of a mistake for Matthew Skoltz behind them. He wasn't quite clean through turn seven, trying to make it back up. A very difficult section, 8A, 8B, 9A, 9B, down to 9C. Turn 10 is the one at the top of the hill where Tony's getting into right now. It's very rhythmic there and one line as well. So if you lose a little bit of rhythm, you can start to lose a little time. It's like what's happening with Matthew Skoltz right now? Well, I think Matthew's in a position right now where he realizes he just really can't do anything with these guys. It's, they're, they're fighting amongst themselves. The track is... You know, for, for Matthew right now, the track is very narrow, okay, because these two guys in front are taking up the majority of it. He's still there. He's not going anywhere. He'll be able to draw back up on the back of them. And with two to go, here you go, Greg. He's trying it again. See, Cameron's putting himself in the right spot, but and he's gone wide. He's gone oh. wide this time, and that's going to allow. But see, that's, that's a product of the way Tony rides. It just makes it so 
exhausting and hard to continue to try to do the same stuff. Now, will Matthew be able to close that gap down at all? Two laps to go in this one, and Tony Lee has got the break he needed in terms of the pressure, although he's not going to know that. He might from the noise behind him. They often, these riders talk about the noise you can hear the other competitor, and now there's a little bit of a gap. He's going to get a plus one on his board, though, this next time. Those guys are going to let him know that he's opened up. Cameron's going to try to shoot it back up underneath Matthew, and he does. Is he going to be able to hold it down tight? Yep. This is what this is what Cameron does, never gives up. And you watch this next lap. This next lap and a half from Cameron will be spectacular. He'll draw, he'll, he'll, he'll start to draw back up on the back of Tony on this last lap. Cameron Bobier, two-time Superbike oh, champion. He's in deep there too. He, he is, is. can yep. he get it turned? He's doing it. So the Monster Energy Yamalube factory Yamaha of Cameron Bobier trying to make up for the mistake he just had, but time is running out. Only a couple corners until Tony Elias sees that white flag. You watch this last lap by Cameron Bobia. I wouldn't be surprised to see my screen lighting up purple, 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 because he's he's not giving up, Greg. I promise you, he's going to go after him as hard as he can. That's a 24-8 for Tony, 25-8. So a full second difference between these two guys on that lap alone. That's what a little mistake makes, and you can see Cameron's got that bike tied up in knots as they went through turn one. But he's doing everything he can to try to close back up on Tony and just give himself a shot at the line. Such a tall order to ask the Dunlop tires so deep into this race, in this heat. How much grip do they have? How much confidence does Cameron Bobier have in his <laughs> motorcycle? Because Tony Elias knows what's at stake in this one. Another race win is on the horizon as he comes through turn number seven. Cam Bobier just set the fastest split time of the entire race. Jason, you're calling it, but is it too little, too late for Cam Bobier? The guy is so good, it blows me away watching Cameron ride. He's able to do this at the end of the race on old tires. He just went the fastest first, but the bike is sideways, sideways back there. As great as it is to watch Tony right now, I just watching Cameron close this gap is insane. So <laughs> just not enough racetrack. Cameron Bobier asking so much. Wow, and he was sliding. Fastest split number two of the entire race. He may set the fastest lap of the race trying to chase Tony. Here comes Tony Elias out of the last corner and the dash to the checkered flag. And it will be Tony Elias who will take victory here at Virginia International Raceway. And in doing so, Cameron Bobier set the fastest lap of the race, a 124.068. Jason Pridmore called it. I got to give it to you, dude. <laughs> that was a great it's an call. easy call. And oh man, if you're Dunlop right now, you are saying how amazing is that race rubber that we put underneath Cameron Bobier and all these racers. Those tires held up to, I don't think I've seen a last lap, fastest lap of the race in Motul Superbike yeah, in a long time. If anybody's going to do it, it's going to be that kid. He's got a lot of talent. Wow. I know that there's a lot of frustration probably in his helmet right now because he wanted to win this race. And But Tony, this is a kind of track for Tony that it's very hard to beat him at because of how he rides. And that's really it. I said two or three years ago that he kind of changed the dynamic of the way we look at our series, and he really has. And, you know, when you get somebody of Cameron Bobier's talent that's trying everything he can, throwing all he can at Tony to make a pass, uh, but you can see what Cameron did on the last lap there with some clear track. Just amazing ride from him, but what can you say about Tony? Yeah. Just, he's such an incredible rider. Perfect he, helmet too, Jason. Yeah. Incredible Hulk, incredible Elias. Yep. Tony. What a move, what a race for him under tremendous pressure. And by the way, just to give you an idea, Tony Elias set the fastest personal lap of his race yep. on the last lap. A 24.615 for Tony. It was only bested by Cameron Bobier. So just to give you an idea of how fast, incredible Cameron was riding, he gave away one point, now nah, just say one second basically in that penultimate he lap. He did, it was a full second, yeah. Tony set his personal fastest lap of the race. Cameron, the fastest lap of the race, period, and clawed back just about one half of a second. Yeah, it's amazing, yeah. And, and so yeah, margin of victory, 0.5 in the end. Great job from Matthew Skoltz. Also, we can't lose fact that this guy was up there the entire race. And I think that if we can see Matthew get a really good start somewhere and be able to, to control the race the way he might want to control it, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised to see him uh, you know, win in a straight-up shoot against those other two guys in a dry race. 
And Jay, just to give another plug really for Dunlop and how great these tires are, a shout out to 10th place finisher David Anthony. Yep. David Anthony on that Fly Street Racing Kawasaki, he set his personal fastest lap of the race on the last lap as well at a 25.4. So a lot of riders able to do very, very quick lap times, obviously the fastest lap of the race, deep into this race. And that'll make Dunlop very pleased as they make their way into Park Ferme. Gotta send a shout out to Jake Lewis and what an effort he put in after tragedy. He comes to the racetrack and he will walk away with the M4X Star Suzuki team with two solid fifth place finishes for that developing superbike program. But this is the man of the hour. Tony Elias, that incredible Hulk helmet, tells the story as he and his crew have put together a spectacular package. We talked about it yesterday, a brand new part for that motorcycle, the back half of the motorcycle completely new, and Tony and his team working very hard to get that motorcycle working for him with that new swing arm, and they will come away with a pair of victories in the Motul Superbike class. It's Tony Elias, Cameron Bobier, and Matthew Skultz, Josh Heron, who put on a spectacular show for us. I know, at least for Josh Heron finishing fourth, the better consolation would have been if he could have got out front and just led for a little yeah, while. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And then Jake Lewis in fifth, Kyle Wyman on that 60 helmet machine. will finish in sixth spot ahead of Danny Eslick. So he won that battle, did Kyle Wyman. Bobby Fong in eighth. Cam Peterson, great job by him and the Genuine Broster Chicken Honda team to finish this race as we head off into a, a break before we get to Road America. All right, we'll take a break here on BN Sports. When we come back, we'll hear from Tony, Cam, and Matthew about their experience and their race number two. It was fantastic. Tony Lisa for Cameron Bobier and Matthew Skultz definitely showing he can do it in the dry. Well, before we get to all the celebration in Champagne, let's get down to Victory Lane and Hannah, who has our podium finishers. I'm here with our third place finisher, Matt Skultz, another solid podium for you. At the beginning of the race, were you looking for Josh to make a move on Tony before you made your move on Josh? I mean, I kind of knew that that the pace was faster than than than, than the first race. So I, I think guys were just a little bit more more keen just to settle down and 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 follow. But yeah, it was a brilliant race. I'm happy to be back up on the podium. Yeah, thank you to the Yamlu Westby guys. I mean, it was an awesome race, man. And and to finish so so close to, to the factory guys was really something special for us. I'm looking forward to the next round. You look like you were having a hard time keeping up with Tony and Cam right at the end there. Tell us about what what was happening there. Yeah, I mean, I, I was just kind of losing the drive out of the corners and, you know, I kind of lost the toe and I had a few big front-end moments. So, I mean, I kind of had to settle. It was a little bit hard seeing them, you know, vanish in the, uh, the, the final two or three laps. But, you know, I'm, I'm still really positive that we closed the gap from the first race. And, yeah, just looking forward to hopefully getting better and better throughout the year. Thanks, Matt. We'll see you in a few weeks at Road America. And really, after all those laps, Jason, only, you know, 23 laps, 3.8 seconds of drift. I mean, it's absolutely nothing. And more valuable, I think, is that he's able to do this pace and finish the race, and he'll give all those laps of data to his crew. That's right. And they're just going to keep working hard and continuing developing this motorcycle to Matthew's liking. Making it better all the time for him. And uh, last ra last year, the, the races he did, he's used to go on superbike distance, but a little different machinery than he's on last year. And, and uh, they'll get that data and they'll move forward. So as the Motul Superbike class is wrapped on this one, Let's get back down to Hannah, who has more from Victory Circle. I'm with our second place finisher, Cam Bobier. Cam, again, another tough battle with Tony. Talk a little bit about how that was for you. Yeah, you know, it's tough. Uh, after yesterday, I, I was kind of running out of grip there at the end of the race. And uh, so today, I just tried a different tactic. I wanted to slot in. And uh, yeah, those four guys, Heron, Schultze, uh, Elias were going really fast at the beginning. I slotted in and uh, just was trying to be patient and uh, made my way up in the, the last few laps, or I would say the last seven laps behind Tony. And uh, yeah, it was just struggling to get by him on the brakes. I, I did once and then uh, kind of got sucked in one, ran wide almost kind of teeter-tottering on the, on the white line. 
and uh, it was pretty much over from there. I made it like I made a last lap push as hard as I could, everything I could. Um, it just wasn't enough. So uh, sorry to my guys. You know, I know how hard they work, but uh, we're gonna go get them in Road America. I'm sick of second place. <laughs> you actually set the fastest lap of the entire race on your last lap. Talk about how the grip was there, because you said you weren't having the same luck with that yesterday. Yeah, you know, it was actually pretty good compared to to compared to yesterday at the end of the race. I was uh, I was pretty happy with uh, my decision, you know, to to kind of take the beginning mellow and uh, conserve it a little bit as much as I could. And uh, yeah, I, I had good tire life at the end. You know, I just made a little mistake, got sucked in. Um, it's a bummer. Like I said, I'm sick of <laughs> sick of second place, but uh, we're gonna go get him uh, at Road America. So big thanks to Monster Energy, Yamaha, Yamalu, uh, Bell, Alpine Stars, everyone, uh, everyone back home. Say hi to my family, and uh, yeah, Road America around the corner. Congratulations, thanks, Cameron. And so there you go, Jay. Hashtag sick of second place, Cameron Bobier, and we know that he is. He loves to win, and so far this season. It's a big goose egg in the win column for Bobier, but he'll rack him up though. When he gets going, he'll be all right. And I think Road America will be a good place for him to start. Expect to see like four or five, maybe six bikes in that lead draft at Road America. That'll be a fun one to watch. But Cameron doesn't finish second very often without starting to put some wins together. So four second place finishes for Cameron Bobier and a third place finish so far in the year after that disastrous ninth place finish in race number one. Let's get back down to Hannah, who's got one very happy racer. Back-to-back -back race wins for Tony Elias this weekend. You're looking pretty tired right now. Were you feeling some extra pressure with three riders so close behind you there for most of the race? I arrived here uh, Thursday a little bit, little bit tired, and I continue tired for for yesterday from and also today. Uh, Friday was incredibly hot and I paid a little bit, but we worked hard for the races. Today I wanted to lead, uh, make a different race than yesterday, but it was more difficult. Uh, I was thinking only was Cameron and me uh, like yesterday, but when I turned back and I see Matthew there and said, oh man, I cannot, I, I wanted to, to let pass him, let pass Cameron, to rest a little bit behind him and tried to analyze the situation a little bit better, but when I saw Matt, I said, impossible. You have to be in front, you have to lead, you have to push, close the, match, the, the doors, and, and well, the last five laps I was trying to rest a little bit, because I knew the last lap was, was the most important lap. Um, lucky I rest because I was fresh for the last lap and push a lot, no mistakes, my best lap of the race, but Cameron was incredibly fast. Like he was not close enough. Um, he's amazing. Two double wins here in in BIR uh, is, is amazing. He's not the, the best track for us, for Suzuki. And we take some advantage. Uh, we are really happy. And thanks to my team to, to work hard and give me for today a uh, um, little bit more comfortable bike than yesterday. Now Cameron made a mistake and ran a little bit wide toward the end of the race there. Were you able to hear that he wasn't so close behind you? And if you were, did, did that bring you any relief there? Well, I hear his engine every lap, every corner very close. I didn't know um, he, he did a, a mistake. Um, if, no, if, I did a, if I know it, maybe I did something different. But huh, lucky I had some advantage because I, I was sure he, he wanted to try. He had uh, more pace than us this weekend. Maybe he could pass, overtake us uh, in three points. Um, and well, lucky I take some advantage and we, we win. Thank Congratulations, thank you, Tony. So Tony Elias uh, hammered on that one, definitely. You could tell from, uh, from his tone and his energy level that he threw it all out on the racetrack. His personal fastest lap of the race on the last lap, trying to fend off the attack of Cameron Bobier after a slight mistake. So congratulations to Tony Elias and the Yoshimura Suzuki factory racing team. I think one of the coolest things too, listening to Tony is how he plans his races. He says, I wanted to plan something a little bit differently today. As you get a look at our point standings now, Tony with what would really be a pretty big points lead this early in the season, 35 points over both Matthew Skoltz and Cameron Bobier, both tied mm. for second. Josh Heron, uh, fourth, Jake Lewis, fifth, Kyle Wyman, Garrett, who wasn't here with us today, and Dave Anthony and Danny Eslick. But that 35 point lead, this early is pretty pretty incredible. And really, if you look at Josh Heron, who's sitting there, you know, in the top five in points, 
A lot of that credit has to go with the effort that was made to get him on that motorcycle, that uh, <laughs> track day bike that he had Absolutely. in Atlanta. And so that's putting him high up in those point standings as we shuffle through the rest of the Motul Superbike field in the championship point standings. So we'll transition on to the podium as the celebrations are beginning as race two for round number three of the 2018 Moto America Championship is in the books. And you can talk, you know, you hear the riders talking about our next round in a few weeks' time. We're going to be at a fan favorite, a team favorite, and a racer favorite. Road America, another natural road course that these racers love. We'll take a break. We're coming back. Stay with us. Moto America was presented by Dunlop. Dunlop Motorcycle Tires builds the official Moto America race tire right here in the USA and powered by Kawasaki. Let the good times roll. Welcome back to Virginia International Raceway as our top three finishers, Tony Elias, Cameron Bobier, Matthew Skultz, getting ready to celebrate. Jason, that was an absolutely fantastic race. I mean, we saw so many great things from this rider, Tony Elias, and the way he was racing behind him. I mean, he was racing forward, but he really knows, like he races 360 around yeah. his motorcycle. He's always, he? always thinking very, very high IQ uh, race-wise uh, as, as a racer itself. I mean, he's always got all of his senses about him of what he does, and he's very cagey and knows exactly what he has to do to win races. He knows exactly how to manage corners i mean it's it, it's it's really the case i've seen this guy do so many different things in so many different places i go out and i watch these sessions as you know and and it's it's fun watching him and cameron too skultz is just going to continue to keep getting better and come into his own uh, all these guys have tremendous teams around them which is the next you know the next thing i think you talk about uh somebody like matthew it's going to give him a lot of confidence knowing he's only 3.8 seconds behind the guy that's winning the championship so uh, I know Matthew wants to get that, that one race where he's battling these guys in the dry, and, and it's coming. Plus, looking forward to Road America, you come to VIR and you say, you know, this is a, this is a rider's racetrack. This track benefits or rewards great setup of the motorcycle and not big, you know, horsepower. Yep. But Road America does, and we could see a big pack of riders.